Good morning, boys and girls. It's me, Pastor Ken. I hope you're doing well on this Palm Sunday. And I was wondering if you remember the story of Palm Sunday. Um, Jesus and his disciples were going into a city. Do you remember which city that was they were going into? It was Jerusalem, the big city. And uh, he sent two of his disciples uh, on ahead of him to get him something something to ride on. Now you would think that Jesus would want to ride into town on a big flashy white stallion or something really majestic like that, but instead Jesus asked them to go on ahead and get a donkey. Now I have here with me a donkey and her name is Betsy. Say hi Betsy. She's not interested in me because I don't have any food right now. But this is my friend Betsy. We just met and she is a sweetheart. But when, uh, when, when uh, Jesus was sending his friends ahead, he said, go ahead and get me this donkey. And this donkey was just a baby donkey. It hadn't even been ridden on before. And uh, it's kind of silly to ride in on a baby donkey into Jerusalem, but that's what happened. His Jesus, Jesus and his friends made his way down the hill uh, into town, and what happened? People came out of nowhere, and uh, they saw him coming, and they took off their coats, and they laid them on the ground in front of him. And some of them who didn't have coats to put down, they went and cut palm branches and waved them around and laid them on the ground in front of him and the donkey. Um, and then what did all these people in the crowd start doing? They started singing and shouting. What were they singing and shouting? Do you remember? They were shouting, Hosanna. Mark chapter 11 verses 9 and 10 tells this is this those who went ahead and those who followed shouted Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David Hosanna in the highest now what does Hosanna mean I never knew when I was growing up I thought it meant like hallelujah which means praise the Lord or something like that but Hosanna actually means save or please save us so that must have been a fun day right kind of like being in a wonderful parade I wonder I wonder if any of you have ever had someone who is older than you ask you to do something that's really important how did that make you feel when they asked you to do that what do you think Betsy how, do, how does that make you feel? There she is. When I was your age, my parents asked me uh, to do an important job. They asked me, they asked me to be in charge. And I was the youngest kid. So when my parents would go off on a date or something, they would say, uh, to us kids as we were as they were leaving they said be good don't burn the house down and listen to your little brother because he's in charge now how do you think that made me feel important right it certainly did I felt really important it made me feel so important that my chest would swell up and I'd start strutting around and uh, start thinking about how I was gonna boss my older sisters around until my parents got home do you think my bigger sisters listened to me? Nope, they didn't. But I still felt important because my parents had given me an important job. Now imagine what that would have felt like for this baby donkey on Palm Sunday. Now of course we don't know how the donkey felt, but we can use our imaginations and uh, that's what we'll do today. What do you think, Betsy? How did that donkey feel on Palm Sunday? 
I'm thinking the same. I agree with Betsy. I imagine that one minute here this little donkey was getting in trouble with his mother for not keeping his stall clean and then the next minute uh, you have an important job. You have to carry the king into the city and not just any king but Jesus the king of all kings. Are you coming to say hi? All right. She likes carrots. Now Jesus was riding on his back and people are shouting and singing and dancing before him as he walks into the city. Now how would you feel if you were that donkey? What do you think, Betsy? Was the donkey excited? I bet so. I bet he felt very important. Now I wonder how that young donkey might feel the next day when all of a sudden he wasn't so important anymore. What do you think, Betsy? How would that donkey feel? Probably a little disappointed, right? Perhaps he woke up the next day and thinking of the day before, I mean, it was definitely the most exciting day of his life. He had never been so proud he never felt so important. Maybe he thought, I think I'll go into town and visit all of my loving fans who will be gathering water at the well. But when he got there, no one even noticed him. And this might have made him kind of mad. And so he said, hey, throw down your coats in front of me. Cut some palm branches. I'm here. Don't you know who I am? But they just looked at him like he was a crazy donkey. One person even smacked him on the tail and told him to go away. Ugh, I imagine him thinking, foolish humans, forget them. I'll go down to, into the market where all the good people are and they will remember me. But no one recognized him there either. Now his feelings are hurt, and I imagine him thinking, Hey, where are the palm branches? You had them yesterday. And the poor little donkey was confused, and he went home to his mother. She always knew what to say to make him feel better, right? Now I imagine his mother saying, Oh, come here, little donkey. And she snuggled him up close to her, and she said, Poor little donkey, don't you know that you're just an ordinary donkey? What was so special about you yesterday was Jesus. And how wonderful it is that an ordinary donkey like you got to be part of his great big day. Now that's just a made up story, right? But I think it's got a good lesson for us. By ourselves, we are not that special. We're just ordinary boys and girls, ordinary people. But when we serve Jesus like this ordinary donkey, like an ordinary donkey like Betsy. Then we get to be part of something special. We feel good because we're doing something big and important. We're working with Jesus to save people. So why don't we pray? Dear Jesus, we thank you for Palm Sunday. What an exciting day that must have been with the palm branches and the singing Hosanna and the parade and Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. We're thankful that you like to use all kinds of people to do your work, even boys and girls and young donkeys. Thank you for our new friend Betsy. Help us to serve you in any way we can and to give you all the credit for it. Hosanna. Hosanna King Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. It's me, Pastor Ken. Happy Palm Sunday to you. Coming to you from my study here in Spartanage. Uh, I hope you're having a great Palm Sunday. I couldn't find any palm fronds today, so I had to settle with Douglas fir. So, Hosanna! The Lord calls us to worship Him this morning with these words from Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. 
shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Let us sing uh, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. calls us to confess our sins to him this morning with these words. Like the people who greeted Jesus as he entered into Jerusalem, and then later on that week pronounced, crucify him, we are fickle people who often deny Christ in our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Remembering the events of Jesus last week helps us to see ourselves for what we are, sinners in desperate need of a Savior. A Savior, praise God, we have in Christ. In honesty and hope, we confess our sins to God. Let us pray. O King of glory, we confess that our praise of your majesty has often been faint. Our performance as citizens of your kingdom, treasonous. For we have surrendered to the enemy by our secret and our known sins. For our treason, you died, Lord Jesus. For our restoration, you rose again. Draw us closer to you in this holy week, so that our eyes may catch the vision of your tears and our hearts the wonder of your grace. By the Holy Spirit's continuing discipline, let us be loyal and loving servants of the King. Praise be to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear these words of assurance from Psalm 118. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress I called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. I shall not die, 
but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, in Christ God answers us and sets us free. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We will respond by singing King of Kings. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Now we lift up our hearts to the Lord with our congregational prayer. And today we have a number of prayer requests. Uh, we were asked to pray this morning for um, Ren Bessemer, who is the great niece of L.B. Terpstra. Uh, she was admitted to the hospital at just four years old with something 
uh, called disseminated encephalomyelitis. I probably didn't pronounce that properly, but it sounds like a, a pretty big deal. It's an inflammation um, on her brain. And uh, they're going to be dealing with a test uh, on Saturday. So that would be yesterday. And uh, we need to just pray for this family. This has got to be very hard for them. Doctor goes a long ways away from home as well. We're also asked to pray for Julie DeVries and uh, her family. Julie's mother-in-law, Vera, passed away. Um, and this has got to be a really hard time to lose loved ones as well. Uh, can't be face-to-face -face with many people. And the mourning process has to be very difficult. So we'll pray for all those who are mourning. Oh, we're also asked to pray for the family of Joe Lynn, uh, who is a neighbor to Cal and Ellie Turtra. Or, pardon me, Foma. Uh, for many years, she had a sudden heart attack and stroke, so we'll be in prayers for her family. Um, we're also going to be praying for Barb Nydrink. She's still doing uh, much better. In fact, the doctors are just very thrilled with her recovery. She got her feeding tube out and is doing well. Um, there's still some hurdles she has to go through in her recovery and possibly more treatment. We're not sure. So we'll continue to pray for Barb Nindry and others who are in nursing homes as well. Uh, you know, they're, they're dealing with great difficulty, not being able to see relatives and so forth. And we'll also pray for those in adult foster care homes that can't see their relatives and don't understand why. And we'll pray specifically for Ryan Ohm. We'll also be in prayers, uh, continuing our prayers rather, for Joyce Personair, um, continuing to deal with this cancer diagnosis. She's in God's hands and we trust him with it. Uh, and we will also pray for Scott Miller, uh, Herman Pan Fusserman's son, uh, who started remo chemo and radiation this Sunday, or this past week, so we're grateful for that and we pray that things go well and that he doesn't have a uh, terrible reaction to the chemo. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, lead us in the way of Christ. At the beginning of this holy week we come to you and we ask that you would give us the courage to take up our cross and in full reliance upon your grace to follow Jesus Christ. Help us to love you above all else and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to demonstrate that, uh, that love that you have given us in, with our actions and with our words by the power of your Holy Spirit. Give us the strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection when with the redeemed of all the ages we will feast with you at your table in glory. Father, we want to lift up to you some of our brothers and sisters who are struggling. We pray for the family of Ren Bessman, this four-year-old girl in the hospital with something that sounds very scary. We place her in your hands and we pray that you give her and her family, all the comfort and protection that they need. Give the doctors and nurses the wisdom they need to treat her, and we pray that she'll be able to come home soon. Father, we also want to lift up to you Julia Reed, as she's mourning the loss of her mother-in-law, Vera. And we lift up others who are mourning as well. We, we think of uh, the family of Joe Lynn, and how difficult this must be to those who are mourning the loss of loved ones and yet cannot go through all of the things that, that we would normally do, things that bring peace and closure. We pray that you give them an extra dose of the peace that only you can provide. Comfort them and wipe away their tears. Find ways, Lord, you can do these things to give them joy even in the midst of their sorrow. We want to lift up to you those who are quarantined in nursing homes, uh, in adult foster care homes, and can't see their relatives, and many don't understand why. We pray that you would comfort them and comfort their loved ones who would just love to see them. We think of Ryan Ohm, and uh, 
and also specifically this morning uh, for Barb Nyingrink, we thank you for all the healing that she's done. Uh, so she's able to have her feeding tube out and is doing so well, uh, according to her doctors. We pray that you give her more uh, increasing patience as she seeks to recover. And um, we pray that any future treatment that she has, uh, that she wouldn't need any more future treatment. We want to lift up to you, uh, Scott Miller, and we thank you for him uh, being able to start chemotherapy and radiation this week. We pray for him and his family, that you give them strength to face each day and the challenges that come. We pray that these procedures, that these treatments that he's receiving are successful and that he doesn't have uh, bad reactions to them. We want to lift up to you. Joyce Personnaire as well, and the, uh, the health issues that she's experiencing right now. We pray that you would give her and Pastor Bruce comfort and strength. They know you well, Lord, and they know the hope that they have in Jesus Christ and that they are in your hands. So we pray that you just comfort them and all who love them, help them to be a, a good witness in the midst of this time. We know they will be. Father, we pray for all those who are struggling. Give them peace and comfort and strength. We pray against the anxiety that seems to be flooding our society. We have hope. And we pray that you help us to hold out that, that light of hope that is Jesus Christ to a world that so desperately needs to hear. Lord, through Christ, all glory and honor are yours. You are our Almighty Father. And with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, this glory is yours forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you are just joining us, we now turn to God's Word, and uh, if you're just joining us, we've been going through this series called I Am, Jesus in His Own Words from the Gospel of John, and we've been looking at some big claims that Jesus makes, in which He always begins with the, the, the two words, I Am, and uh, today we're going to be in John chapter uh, 15, verses 1 through 17, and I'm reading to you this morning from the English Standard Version. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may, be more, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away, like a branch and withered. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. 
but I have called you friends. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you may go should that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name he may give to you these things i command you so that you will love one another may the lord bless the reading of his holy word this morning now jesus big claim in this passage is that he is the true vine, which implies that there are other vines which are false. And to be able to grasp what Jesus is saying here, we have to ask that important question, what's the deal with the true vine? Now, there are a number of different options for the answer to this question, and uh, you may hear sermons or, or read commentaries that will tell you different things. There's really two options, and I think they're both true. Uh, the first one that is that Jesus is using here uh, a general metaphor. In other words, he's saying that there are lots of different vines in the world that people try to graft themselves onto to be able to, uh, to find life and sustenance and power to to live good lives and so forth. And if that's what Jesus is saying here, he's saying that he is the true vine and all of those other vines are false. And they won't bring life or fruit or satisfaction. I think that's very true. I think also there's a more uh, general biblical idea of what Jesus is saying here uh, that I'll call a biblical metaphor. You see, all throughout the Bible, we see uh, the metaphor of the vine. Uh, in the Old Testament in particular, we see vine being a description of um, God's people Israel. And in fact, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 21 we sort of have an indictment of God's people and how they haven't done what they were supposed to do. Uh, and it says this, Yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? In other words, God planted these people Israel into the promised land and they were supposed to be fruitful and, and everything, but they didn't. They went wild and no good. Isaiah chapter uh, 5, verses 1 through 7, expands upon this idea. Uh, and it says this, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and he hewed out a wine vat in it. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I should not have done in it, that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes or sour grapes or terrible grapes? Worthless grapes. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, its protection, the fence around it, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. What, what God is saying here in this passage is that 
his people, his chosen people, had abandoned him. They had gone their own way. They went wild and degenerate. And when he called them to justice, they just brought injustice, bloodshed. It's an ugly sight in the eyes of God, his people, is what God is saying. He doesn't want anything to do with his vineyard any longer. In Psalm 80, we see the flip side of the situation. What it was like for the vine, if you will, for the people of Israel, when God did, in fact, do these things. When he brought judgment upon the people of Israel for disobeying him, for going wild, producing no good fruit. Psalm 80, verses uh, 8 through 15. You brought a vine out of Egypt. This, God's people are speaking to the Lord. You drove out the nations and you planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It set out branches to the sea and it shoots to the river. Why? Then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way may pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that may, all that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted and for the Son whom you made strong for yourself. What, what the psalmist is saying here is they're not understanding why God has allowed this judgment. And they're pleading with him to turn again to them. Now, perhaps this person who wrote this psalm was not one of the people that had gone so far astray. Maybe they were one of God's remnant, his faithful, we don't know. But they don't understand, but they know that God has judged them. And they're crying out to him. So maybe what Jesus is saying here, and I think definitely what Jesus is saying here, is that he is the true vine. All who have gone before him, all of God's people that he had planted in the promised land to be his people were a false vine. They didn't live up to their covenant responsibilities. They disobeyed God. They worshipped false gods. They did not love one another. They just didn't. And so Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. I do what is right. I've done what God has commanded us all to do. I'm the true vine, and you are the branches. So, th that's the first question that we deal with in this passage. What, what's the big deal with the vine? But uh, another question that Jesus asks is, or that we should ask, is what does Jesus mean by fruit? This is a metaphor, metaphor that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. Um, for many of us, we live in a post-agrarian society. We buy our fruits and vegetables and produce from the store. Uh, what, what does Jesus mean by fruit? Well, the simplest definition, and there are a lot of deeper ones, but the simplest definition is that a fruitful life is a life that pleases God. So, Jesus saying that he is the true vine, and then... We are the branches, and if we want to produce good fruit, we have to be connected to Him. Um, a life that does not produce fruit in the biblical way is a life that does not please God. Perhaps the most well-known passage where this is uh, elucidated upon is from Galatians 5, when we read about the fruits of the Spirit. But before we read about the fruit of the Spirit, we read about the 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 works of the flesh or of life that does not please God. So we read in Galatians chapter 5. Oh, it's missing here. We read in Galatians chapter 5 these words. Uh, 
the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred and discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So here we have the, the fruit, if you will, of a life that is not pleasing to God, full of all kinds of disobedience and, and completely lacking holiness. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the, the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer that does please God is this, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So the, Jesus means that if we want to honor God, we have to be connected to him, right? We'll break that down more and more as we continue this morning. But um, a, a third question that comes up as we read this passage is this one. What does it mean to abide or remain in Christ? What, what does that actually mean? Uh, and that is, is a challenge to understand. You could spend your entire life meditating upon this question, and you might still not come up with a full answer. But very simply, the word abide or remain in some of your translations is the Greek word meno. And uh, it, it simply means uh, a number of related things. It means to dwell, to live, to make your abode, to, to set up shop, in other words. So Jesus is saying, if you abide in me, you live in me, you, like you live in your home. Every other place that, that this word meno is used is always saying that in the Bible that this person lived here and lived there and they stayed here Jesus is saying if you want to produce a fruit that is pleasing to God a life that is pleasing to God you have to dwell in me so in other words we could say that we need to continually completely depend on Christ and this is a daily thing when I was in college, I my legal address was where my parents lived, right? But that was not where I dwelled. I went back there every few weeks to where my parents lived, but where I dwelled was really on campus. So that's where I remained on a daily basis. I woke up there, I went to sleep there. Um, and that's what Jesus is saying here. This is a continual thing. Or if, if uh, to bring some of today's vernacular into it, Jesus is saying that we need to shelter in place. In other words, we need to find shelter and refuge and complete dependence upon Christ and Christ alone. This is where we need to dwell. Now, If Jesus is the true vine, and all other vines are false and will only bring us death and destruction, then, then what does this mean for us? If we are willing to agree with that statement that Jesus is the true vine, what does that mean for us? What are the implications? Well, there are a number of them. Um, our first implication that Jesus gives us in this passage is from John chapter 15, verses 4 and 5, in, in which Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me, Jesus says. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. The implication that Jesus is laying out here for us is that apart from the true vine, 
we can do nothing good. Oh, sure, we can produce fruit, but that fruit is not good fruit. It's, it's sour grapes. It's worthless fruit, not worthy of being used. Uh, we need to be connected to the vine in order to be a conduit from the life that Jesus gives us to a life that honors God with our fruit. This, this reminds me of one of my earliest memories uh, from my childhood. I was probably, I don't know, three or four years old, and I was at my babysitter's house. And uh, during uh, the nap time, we had a, a thunderstorm came through, and it blew off the, uh, a branch from the oak tree in the front yard. And for some reason, uh, this saddened us children. And we decided we were going to do something about it. So we took this branch that had blown off this tree, and we planted it. We planted it um, in the sandbox because we had heard that uh, manure was good fertilizer, and we knew that the neighbor's cat had been using our sandbox as a litter box. So we planted this uh, oak tree branch into the sandbox. And we patted down the sand around it, and we gave it water. And uh, we really hoped that the branch would live. It didn't live. The next morning when we got back to the babysitter's house and our parents dropped us off, the leaves had already withered and began to turn brown. Because apart from the tree, the branch could not live. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Apart from him, apart from the life that he gives us, we cannot produce anything good. We cannot honor God. We cannot love our neighbors as ourselves. We cannot love the Lord with a true love. We're simply unable to do so. We have to be connected to the source of life and the source of holiness to live a life of holiness that honors and pleases God. Otherwise, all we do is please ourselves. This is the first implication. The second implication comes from verse 6. And Jesus says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, this is a somber implication that Jesus is telling us. Jesus is telling us, that those who are not connected to the vine, those who are not connected to Jesus, will be judged. And that's something we need to take very seriously. You know, anyone who has ever pruned a fruit tree knows that not all the branches produce the fruit. And those branches are taken away and burned in a big pile because they're worthless. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Those who are not connected to him will be judged. If Jesus is who he says he is, then that's a warning we need to take to heart. We need to be concerned about those people in our lives that might not know Jesus. Because they will face that judgment. The third implication comes from verse 7, in which Jesus says, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So what Jesus is saying here is that if we are abiding in Christ or remaining in Christ, then the Lord hears our prayers. The Lord hears the prayers of those who are connected to the vine. Now this is an amazing thing. You know, we pray by uh, the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus the Son to God the Father. And God hears our prayers because of Jesus. That's an amazing thing to think about us. You know, we live in such a short period of time here on earth. And we speak to the eternal God who spoke the universe into existence. And because of Christ, he hears us. That's amazing. The fourth implication of being Jesus being the true vine is this. In verse 8, Jesus says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. What Jesus is saying here is that the purpose of remaining in Christ, remaining in the true vine, 
is to glorify God. This is what we were designed to do. And so if we want to do what we were designed to do, we have to remain in Christ. And that's how we glorify God. We can't do it apart from Him. The fifth implication comes from verse 9. Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Those who abide in Christ are loved. This is another amazing thing because there is nothing about us that is worthy of God's love, that is worthy of God's forgiveness. And yet, as we read in 1 John chapter 3, how great the love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. What, what Jesus is saying here is in Him we are loved. We sinful people are loved by a holy God. That's amazing. Only in Christ can we find this love. The fifth implication comes from John chapter 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Here we see another aspect of those who are seeking to abide in Christ that to love him means striving to obey him. And, and we'll never be perfect this side of eternity, that is for sure. But this is our motivation, to love Christ, to say thank you for all that you've done for me by living a, a life that is pleasing to him, by obeying his commands. The next implication comes from verse 17. Jesus says, these things I command you, all of these things that we've read so far, these things I command you are so that you will love one another. So Jesus is telling us that loving Christ also means striving to love one another. You can't say, I love you, Jesus, but I don't like the church. I don't like other Christians. You can't say that because they are part of his vine. They are grafted into him. And we need to strive to love them as well. Our final implication comes from verse 11. Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full, or your joy may be complete. I don't know about you, but I want to be, I want my joy tank to be completely full. I want my joy to be complete. That's the kind of life I want to live. And that's what Jesus is telling us. Complete joy is only found in Christ. All around us, we search for joy in everything. We search for joy in the temptations that the world gives us, the promises that they make. We seek for joy in our relationships uh, with our loved ones and with our friends and family members. We seek joy in, in whatever our flesh calls us to. And yet, these things may give us a, a, a small sense of joy, but a joy that fades, and often fades quickly. Jesus tells us here that complete joy is only found in Him. And this is the good news, that there is a joy available in a world that's full of sadness and despair, we know that hope is available, that joy is available, and it's found only in Christ. See, here's the thing. God created us good, and in his own image and likeness, but our first parents, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God. They thought they could find joy and fulfillment and life and truth elsewhere, and they couldn't. And ever since then, we've been born enemies of God, unable to truly please Him. And there's no way that we can measure up to His perfect standard. And the problem is that God is just, and He has to punish sin, the sin that you and I commit. He can't wrap his arms around sinful people like you and me. He has to punish it. And it doesn't matter what we do. 
It doesn't matter how many good things we do, how much we give to charity, to the poor, how much you know we recycle or, or seek to be uh, positive citizens of this planet Earth. It doesn't matter how many good things we do because we can never earn his forgiveness. We can never escape his judgment. In fact, we just make it worse every day. God is just and he has to punish sin, but he is also loving and merciful. And he sends a substitute. Someone to take our place. Someone to live a perfect life. Someone who's fully God and yet fully human. Someone who never sins, though they're tempted in every way just as we are. And this someone is, of course, Jesus, the true vine. And Jesus proved that he is the true vine by living his perfect life, by dying in our place on the cross, by rising from the grave. And this Christ, this Jesus, this true vine, invites us to a new life. He invites us to repent of our sin, to turn away from all of those vines of the world, all of those things that promise joy and can't provide it. And he invites us to turn to him in faith, to be converted, transformed and made new by the power of Christ, the true vine. And when we respond to that call, he gives us a new mission. We're saved. We've been saved for a purpose. We've been saved to do good works for three reasons. So that by our living, by how we respond to God's uh, salvation that he has given us in Jesus Christ, we can show him how thankful we are. Uh, and second, by our good works, by our fruit, we can be assured of our salvation, that we have indeed been transformed and made new. And third, so that we can uh, lead others to know this great salvation that we have, this complete joy that we have in Christ Jesus, and only in Christ Jesus. This is what Jesus is calling us to, to trust in him, to remain in him, to abide in him alone, so that we can have this complete joy, so that we can glorify God and, and show him how thankful we are. This is what Jesus is calling us to. So is Jesus the true vine? Or is he just a vine? If Jesus is the true vine, then call out to him. Put your trust in him. Remain in him. Abide in him. Let his words abide in you. Obey his commands. Come to him. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Jesus makes a bold claim here in this passage. We are grateful for it. For we confess that we have often departed from the vine departed from Christ, gone our own way, gone wild. We need you to bring us back to you. Forgive us for all the times in which we've gone astray, in which we thought we could produce good fruit. We could live a life that glorifies you on our own. Lord, we know now that we cannot do that. Return, to, return us to the joy of the salvation that we have in Christ alone. And it's in his name, in his name alone, that we pray. Amen. Now we will respond to God by singing, I need thee every hour. like
Brothers and sisters, I pray again that you have a great Palm Sunday. Once again, Hosanna. Uh, hear these words of blessing as the Lord sends us out into his world, into his vineyard, to remain in the vine. May our Lord, whose arms were spread on the cross to embrace a sinful world, May he help us this week to take up our crosses and follow him. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, may it guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God. And of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of the Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen. One more thing before you go. First of all, as this is the start of Holy Week, we wanted to tell you about a few things going on this week. Um, for Good Friday, we'll be having a joint community worship service um, via a video uh, with our brothers and sisters from Lamont Community Church, Lamont Christian Reformed Church, Eastmanville United Reformed Church, Coopersville, Christian Reformed Church, and uh, some other ones that I'm probably forgetting, but uh, I'm privileged to participate in this. We'll be looking at the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. So that will be coming out this Friday. More information on that later on. Also, uh, for Holy Week, we're going to be spending this week focusing on prayer, and um, a great idea was passed on to me from my mentor, Brian Bosher about what we could do uh, to focus on prayer this week. And I thought we could look 
at the um, six petitions of Jesus in the Lord's Prayer and just sort of pray those things together. So we're going to have a short time of prayer every day, Monday through Saturday at uh, 1 p.m. That will be live streamed on Facebook. You can join us there. And um, this Saturday, we're going to be joining with um, the Gospel Coalition is doing a day of prayer and fasting uh, about the crisis we're going through, but also because of, uh, of Holy Week. So I will be sending more information about that as well. God bless you and have a great day.